Welcome everyone to this uh, edition of Polycon UK webinars. Today we have a uh, pleasure of hosting Konstantin Sonin from the University of Chicago. The title of the presentation is Why did Putin invade Ukraine? A theory of the generator uh, autocracy. Uh, as usual, our format is one hour presentation, including Q and A's uh, from the audience. So if you have a question, please unmute yourself and ask directly. Uh, but also towards the end, we'll reserve about five minutes for uh, question and answer in, that, that, that is included in one hour. After one, one, hour, one hour, we are going to stop the recording um, and we'll finish the official part of the presentation, but we'll stay for a few more minutes if you have any additional questions or you want to chat um, after the talk. Next week, uh, sorry, not next week, next uh, time is in two weeks. We have on the July 3rd, we have Juan uh, Paul Carvalho from Oxford presenting Zero Sum Traps, the evolution of productivity shifting, stifting beliefs. Um, thank you for coming and Constantin, the floor is yours. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to this seminar. And let me share my screen. So this is a joint paper with Georgi Igor from Northwestern uh, University, and this is a paper about a theoretical paper about why Putin invaded Ukraine. So the starting point, starting point of this paper is that what happened on February twenty four, two thousand twenty two, is actually a huge uh, a huge event. Uh, the invasion of this scale, the war between countries of this size, is a relatively rare event. It happens like invasion like this happens less than once a decade, and Europe hasn't seen anything similar similar in size in terms of death, in, death, in terms of the weapons that are used, in terms of the um, people uh, who are involved in this since the end of the World War. Uh, World War II. So this is a really, really rare event, but the idea of our theory is to put it into a larger, uh, larger context. So let me very briefly discuss what was, uh, what was the like inner reasons of why um, President Putin, his close circle, decided to um, to start this invasion. So, of course, uh, for people from Europe, I do, not need to, I do not need to explain what I explain typically to my American audience, is that the historical tensions and grievances between two neighboring European countries like Ukraine and Russia, these are, this is a very typical European situation. So basically, on, historical, on the basis of the historical grievances, uh, basically every European country could invade their neighbor. There is an episode in history when one country controlled the part of the other. All countries have uh, ethnic minorities inside their, almost all countries have ethnic minorities inside their neighbors. A lot of countries share their language. A lot of countries have significant minorities that speak languages of their uh, neighboring countries. So this is an extremely typical, typical situation. But basically, from what we know, and now we actually know a lot about how this decision was made, and in the paper we cite uh, both the insider accounts and the uh, outsider analytics. So basically, President Putin and his close circle, uh, both inside and outside the government, formed a very specific worldview. And this worldview included like, the following important basic points, which was an input to the decision to invade Ukraine. Ukraine doesn't have a stable government with a strong support. Uh, President Zelensky is merely a puppet of oligarchs or United States or nationalists or Jews or um, uh, Nazis. Uh, anyways, he's a puppet of someone that Ukrainian military is incapable of serious resistance and will not offer serious resistance, that Russian troops will be greeted by his liberators that United States are divided over domestic issues and divided to the extent that they would not pay uh, any serious attention, 
and that European countries are so decadent and weak and so dependent on Russian gas and oil that they would not provide any assistance to Ukraine. So, uh, interestingly, that it's not only it's not only like sociological surveys of the inner elite, not only parts of President Putin's speeches and his reported talks with his subordinates, but it's actually it's actually supported by some facts. For example, uh, they have almost half of the Russian riot police slaughtered in the first weeks of invasion because they sent with the frontline troops they sent the red police from all of the uh, all of the country because they thought that there will be no serious resistance they will be just uh, meeting uh, meeting protest civilian protesters so they were sending these riot police and basically mo most of them had died because they were not um, used to any kind of military military combat then of course russian troops had Parade uniform because they plan a Kiev parade. They have military orchestra again, and an orchestra was slaughtered in the first day of invasion because they thought that an orchestra will be needed because there will be a military parade in Kiev. What's interesting about this very specific world view that it does not, of course, uh, bears any kind of any kind of um, uh, reality. For example, uh, the belief that Ukraine doesn't have a stable government with a strong support, uh, President Zelensky defeated the incumbent president, the incumbent president of Ukraine, with 73% of the vote in 2019. And actually, if you look at the patterns of this vote, this vote was extremely uniform, unlike in all the previous competitive elections in Ukraine. It was uniform across Ukraine. So Zelensky, in the first round, he defeated the Western politicians in the West, the Eastern politicians in the East. So the idea is that he somehow um, doesn't have a lot of legitimacy support. It was just like a pure fantasy. But then again, the idea that Ukrainian military will not offer a serious resistance. The Ukrainian army is led uh, by the same people who fought the Russian army since 2014. And if you look at the map, then the front lines of 2014 in 2015, they're still there. They are basically 800 meters from the boundaries of the Donetsk city. With the people who lead the Ukrainian army now, they were frontline commanders back eight years ago, and they never budged from this. So the idea is that they somehow would um, would uh, skip the combat this time. Again, there was no evidence for this. Um, Ukrainian military was NATO trained and was receiving NATO equipment in the uh, last months before the invasion. So, uh, whatever uh, are divisions in the United States, the United States um, foreign policy over decades and actually over centuries was typically bipartisan and uh, Whatever was promised back 10 years ago to Ukraine, back like two years ago to Ukraine, it was basically the same thing that happened since the war started. The same thing about European countries. And interestingly, even Putin court experts, and he has a certain uh, group of experts who are, have um, who are sort of weak on uh, peer reviewed publications, but have a lot of a lot of authority in the court expertise, but even these court experts, they were actually saying in their um, polite way that these assumptions that the United States would not provide weapons, that European countries are not going to help Ukraine, this is totally off base. Still, despite all this information was present, this uh, decision, uh, this decision was made. Of course, Historically, individual decisions rarely play any kind of critical role in the institutions that matter, it's the big things that matter. Still, some decisions at the top level are very singularly unfortunate. So in Russian history, we have this Nicholas II decision to end the World War in 1914, despite no 
and no threat to any kind of core interest of Russia. And this decision ended up with the, um, with the total destruction of the government, revolution, and ultimately an execution of the royal family. Then, in the hindsight, the Hitler's decision to invade USSR country eight times larger and then declare war against the United States. So basically, um, waging war against countries that had industrial power five times larger than uh, the Germany's base was also um, also a bad decision. It's not necessarily it's not necessarily about the war. So Mao's launch of the big leap forward in 1958 it was it costed. China 20 million people because of the famine, and it nearly costed Mao his political life. So it required actually a sort of a new revolution, the cultural revolution for him, which occupied the rest of his life to get uh, to get power back. Among these decisions, I like the uh, Argentinian dictator Leopoldo Galtieri decision to attack Falklands in 1982. One thing is that, of course, this is not like a huge scale decision, like the decision to end the World War or the decision to launch the big leap forward, but it's also a very low price and a totally crazy, totally unnecessary thing. There were no benefits of this. Still, it led to an um, expected defeat uh, of Argentinian forces um, by British. Uh, by Britain. Then uh, it led to the collapse of first the Galpieri government, then the military government, then the military regime, then eventually all the generals who were involved in this decision spent uh, dozens of years in jail. So, uh, what unites, I think, these decisions that these are authoritarian regimes in which the leaders eventually make such disastrous decisions. But what I think is a puzzle, puzzling about all these things, then of course, sure, leaders that make these, these disastrous decisions have a lot of personal power. Still, you cannot say the, these were not like sultanistic regimes. These regimes were highly institutionalized. There were elaborate government structures that supposedly aggregated information, they supposedly aggregated expertise, there were advisory bodies, they were huge, in some cases, intelligence agencies that provided intelligence and advice. There are consuls. So the information that would have been sufficient to avoid the disastrous decision was, I would say, available. And post-mortem of some of these decisions shows that it was at some, at some level accumulated. But then, at the decision point, this information was not taken into account. So, Constantin, can I no. interrupt? No. Okay, sorry. Uh, so, the theory of the general democracy, basically, it's a theory about the situations, about regimes that are both authorit that are authoritarian and simultaneously personalized and institutionalized. So, it's not like a dictator in isolation making a crazy, badly advised decision. It's a dictator who builds builds power just with the goal to stay in power. And then the system results in disastrous decisions. So now I could for a question. Uh, just coming back three slides back with the list of examples that you had. All uh -huh. those examples had a regime that ultimately failed or... or no, mm, actually not. <laughs> because uh, Saddam Hussein's decision to invade Kuwait in 1991 was a totally disastrous and crazy decision and played badly for him, but he did not lose power as a result of this invasion. He lo lost power uh, on a different, uh, different time, on a different occasion. No, what I meant is that all of these could be viewed as, a, as a risky decisions. But all those examples, your, your argument is that you know they are unfortunate. That's in the in the in the title of the bullet point. But some of those risky gambles, are there any examples in which risky gambles like that that would fit your story but actually played well? 
I, I don't, I, I don't know. Uh, okay, I mean uh, that I, I would say that it might be that the Hitler's attack on France, uh, while and France and Britain was in a sense uh, was in a sense this crazy gamble that played that played well. Okay, thank you. That's that's what. Yeah, I'm but yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to do the following thing. First, I'll tell you the whole model in words. Then I will show the formulas again. So, like, I'm I'm doing this twice. So, the theory of the general autocracy: there is an authoritarian leader who wants to stay in power, and he himself chooses the way to receive information about all kind of threats. So, he appoints secretaries and ministers. He determines the ways in which the government is organized and operates. So basically, whom, who makes what decisions, things like this. The problem for an authoritarian leader, and this is not a new part of this model, it's, it's already in many models. In equilibrium, there's a trade-off. A person who is more competent is more likely to be disloyal. For example, because if someone is a skillful political operator, then if a person is more competent, then this person would better know when to switch allegiances. Or if someone is a person with a higher outside value, then of course, the more competent is this person, the better are the prospects under a new regime. So the less loyal in equilibrium this person is. This is a constraint on the authoritarian leader ability to receive information. Then, Another ingredient of our story is that, of course, one instrument in the hands of a dictator is repression. Dictators kill, torture, intimidate, exile, do all these things with their opponents. In fact, I personally know people, I personally knew people who were killed by Putin, tortured by Putin, intimidated, exiled, so that's what dictators do. And it's also historically true that unpopular dictators have been able to stay in power by terror, at least for the time being. So of course, the benefit of repression is that there is less opposition and less willingness to oppose the dictator. Right? You kill your opponent, there is no opponent. You exile your opponent, the opponent is not in the country. So then, why wouldn't every dictator do the maximum repression? What is the cost of repression? And in our model, uh, the cost of repression is that repressions raise stakes for the incumbent dictator. Right? First, prosecution for past crimes and retaliation are not universal, and economic theorists would not like this because retaliation is not something that um, happens in a imperfect equilibrium, but still it's common in the real life. More importantly, what is the cost of repression? is that former dictators are often in your position. So then the expectation of their return to power depends on their reputation. So for example, if someone took power, dismissed the previous dictator, and this previous dictator was a very cruel person, then the new leader thinks, if this new opposition leader will come back, he will likely execute me. This is the reason why I would execute him. So it's not a retaliation, it's totally strategic and forward-looking, still the cost of doing repression in the past. If I'm doing repression, then I'm less likely survive, to survive uh, when I'm out of power. And I'm actually, I'll show you that this is, there are very good cases showing, showing this. So now combine these two things, the informational constraints and the uh, repression part. There is a feedback loop. The more endangered is the leader, the more important is loyalty. So uh, in, in the situation when someone becomes more repressive in a bad situation, it has to appoint less competent subordinates. So the information that flows to the leader becomes less and less reliable. So repressions increase the chances of survival for the next period in the short term, but they raise stakes, making loyalty again more important. So this creates the dynamics that we want to that we want to have uh, the degenerate autocracy. And the leader is very repressive because he fears for his power, but then because of this, he has to 
appoint uh, appoint incompetent subordinates because incompetent are more loyal. So he's more likely to make a mistake. So again, more repression, less competence, uh, higher chance of a disaster. So okay, uh, there is a big emergent literature on authoritarian politics. There was a literature, basically, authoritarian politics is divided by, there was a literature before Simogla and Robinson, there is you know, Simogla and Robinson, uh, papers written by them, which is almost the same size as the literature before them, and then literature after uh, Simogla and Robinson. So I advertise uh, our survey with Georgi Yegorov, The Political Economics of Non-Democracy, not because this is a great contribution, but because it surveys so many uh, great contribution contributions to authoritarian politics. Also, this is related to the literature on the rationalist perspective on wars, because this is ultimately explains uh, explains the war. So okay, now the formal model. Uh, time is discrete. There is infinite number of periods. There is the incumbent leader, the initial incumbent leader, and there is a sequence of potential challengers. In each period, there is a fight between the incumbent and the challenger, and the power fight is a lottery, in which the odds of the incumbent survival depend on the level of repression the incumbent had chosen, the governance structure the incumbent that the incumbent put in place, and random factors. Uh, the regime's vulnerability and their position strength, uh, these are random. So if the incumbent loses, then the challenger becomes the new leader, the former incumbent becomes their position. At the end of the power fight, the new leader decides whether to not repress their position. So if the leader chooses repression, then the former incumbent or the former incumbent or the former losing challenger depends on depending on who is the new leader, they're out. So in the next period, there is a new challenger from this infinite sequence of challengers with some probability and no challenger with the remaining probability. So the benefit of the repression is that there is a chance that there is no challenge in the next period. Okay. So then in each period, the regime might be vulnerable with some probability. When the regime is vulnerable, it requires paying a cost from the leader to defeat the challenger. The problem is that the incumbent leader does not know whether or not he is vulnerable. He is not perfectly informed. So the leader appoints a lieutenant of some competence, and the lieutenant has the task to make the decision on the leader's behalf, whether to bear the cost or not to bear the cost. The lieutenant is better informed than the leader. He receives informative signal about the regi regime vulnerability, which is informative but noisy. And the noisiness of this signal depends on the lieutenant competence. So the totally competent the lieutenant knows everything, he just knows for sure whether the leader is vul vulnerable or not. And the totally incompetent lieutenant um, has no clue. So for him, he is as um, do this as the as the incumbent leader. So then, in addition, the lieutenant receives a private signal on his personal benefit if the incumbent is defeated. So basically, there is something which is say um, which proxies the lieutenant's alignment with the challenge. But if the lieutenant misuses the information, yet the incumbent wins, there is a punishment for the lieutenant. So this is like a maximum punishment. Maybe his head is his head is chopped. So the idea now, the idea is that uh, it's good for the dictator to have a very competent lieutenant. The problem with a very competent lieutenant that if the very competent lieutenant knows that the leader is vulnerable, he would betray for a lower um, for a lower reward from the challenger. Because a less competent, less competent lieutenant 
uh, is not that sure that the leader is vulnerable. If the leader is not vulnerable, if lieutenant is mistaken, then he will receive a punishment. So the more competent is less fearful of a mistake, so he would be paid for a lower reward. So the, finally, the incumbent maximizes the lifetime utility. Each period in power gives a fixed amount. Each period out of power gives zero. Being repressed gives minus D and in this period and then zero in perpetuity. So the would-be challengers who are potential participants of the game, they get zero until they become the leader. Then they have this lifetime utility as well. The lieutenant leaves only one period, gets a salary if he does not betray the leader, he gets minus P if betrays unsuccessfully, and he gets his reward from the challenger if betrays successfully. So from the leader's perspective, the um, reward is random, the distribution function. So now the timing. In each period, the incumbent appoints a lieutenant of competence to them. The, a challenger who appears with probability mu, which is less than one, if there were repressions in the previous period, and with probability one, if there were no repression. Then, lieutenant learned about the vulnerability of the leader and the own reward if the challenger wins. Then, the lieutenant decides whether to to maintain defense or not maintain defense, basically betray or not betray, to follow what is in the, in the leader's interest or not to follow. Then there is a power fight, a lottery, between the incumbent and the challengers, with the odds that depend on circumstances and lieutenant choices. Then the winner of the power fight learns whether or not the leader was vulnerable and rewards uh, the lieutenant, depending on the so what we do here is that we look at equilibria in which actions in period t might depend on circumstances of period t plus the incumbents and the challenger's reputation and reputation in this paper is a binary variable that reflects whether or not the person or the repression is the one so this is this slightly extends the set of possible equilibria beyond what Mark of perfect equilibrium with a low. So it's like a slightly um, a slightly uh, weaker definition of equilibrium than a mark of perfect equilibrium. Okay, so then the roadmap for the analysis is as follows. First, discuss what happens inside the period, solve the lieutenant problem, then solve the incumbent optimal choice of the lieutenant problem then discuss the interpreted dynamics. Okay, so first, the lieutenant's, lieutenant's decision. A lieutenant of competence theta receives a signal. So when the signal is that the dictator is vulnerable, then uh, we could use the bias formula to determine uh, which the, the probability with which the dictator is actually vulnerable. Um, so when the signal is that the leader is not vulnerable, then the leader is not vulnerable, so it does not make sense to be free. When the signal is that the leader is vulnerable, then the lieutenant compares the expected benefits of betrayal and the expected costs of betrayal, so betrays if and only if this inequality is true. So we could calculate the threshold We could calculate the threshold, which tells us at, mm, at which level of reward the lieutenant betrays. And you see, and this is like perhaps the most important part of the informational constraints on the leader, is that the uh, reward, the threshold reward decreases with the com competent competence of the lieutenant, meaning a more competent lieutenant betrays for a lower reward. So the idea of this is simple. The 
um, the idea of this is pretty simple. A more competent lieutenant knows better where the leader is actually vulnerable. So even a lower reward would protect him as in the risk premium from a wrong decision between a non-vulnerable leader. Then the other part of the comparative statics is also is also quite natural. So this threshold increases with the wage by the incumbent, and it also increases with the punishment by the incumbent if the betrayal is not uh, is not successful. Right? This is only natural. The only um, mildly surprising thing is that the more competent lieutenant betrays for a lower reward. Okay. So now from the dictator standpoint, uh, he would calculate the probability of betrayal of the lieutenant of competence theta because this is uh, this is the multi distribution function of the lieutenant's affinity with the challenger. So this is the probability of losing of the dictator. So then if we denote u and v the dictator's continuation utility if he wins or loses respectively then the incumbent optimization problem looks like this so this is the probability of losing this is the dictator's continuation utility if he, uh, if he loses this is uh, if he wins this is the probability uh, that the lieutenant recommends to Build defense, and this is the cost of defense which protects the leader um, when he's vulnerable. Okay, great. So basically, um, if we solve this the incumbent optimization problem, you could look in the paper, then um, it's a trade off. There is an increasing probability of betrayal depending on the lieutenant competence. There are efficiency losses due to incompetence because the less competent the tenant is, the more, the less um, effective is measures that this lieutenant undertakes. So there is some optimal, um, some optimal competence which is neither one nor zero from the uh, leader standpoint. Okay. So the comparative statics with this incumbent optimization, the optimal choice of competence of the dictator is naturally um, the optimal choice, the optimal competence is lower when the dictator is more vulnerable and when the stakes are higher for the dictator, when the difference between what happens when the dictator wins and the dictator loses is higher. This is the link to the dynamics part of the model, right? Because here we will have the, you do repressions, repression, this increases your probability of being executed if you're out of power. So this raises stakes. That's why you have to choose a, a lower quality, a lower quality lieutenants after you did some, uh, some repression. So naturally when efficiency is less important than confidence, not important. Okay, so now uh, going through a lot of formulas uh, in the paper uh, from the leader's choice to the industrial decision. Um, basically, what we do, what we do, we write down a number of the Bellman, Bellman equations. As I said, we a low strategy of the winner of the power fights to depend on both winners and losers reputation. There are three possible reputations, bad, good, bad, meaning repressed in the past, good, meaning not repressed in the past, good, 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 bad. Of course, there could not be two, two bad people uh, because one of them would have been in the, other in the previous period. So we write uh, we write down the Bellman equations, five equations, three possible pairs, 15 equations in total, which show that exists, that there exists an equilibrium. So basically now it's all about, um, about uh, 
uh, the paths that the beam follows in equilibrium. So first, there is a peaceful path. Leaders out in power and come back until die naturally. And it might seem, it might seem that this is a kind of a very theoretical thing, like leaders spare each other. So this is an equilibrium thing to spare each other. They appoint uh, relatively competent advisors. They still lose with some probability. So they're still alternating in power. And the thing is that this actually happened. This uh, illustration is from an older paper, but it's a very similar, very similar paper. And here we wanted to illustrate vertical equilibrium in which winners always spare losers. So basically, this is a history of 80 years of military dictators in Venezuela. And you see the colored, uh, colored, um, colored lines. These are years which one of these dictators was in power. The gray areas, these are people who, these are other people who never came back. All of these people were leaders more than one time, right? So these, these, how many, these 13 leaders, they came back more than once. And some of them, like um, Antonio Guzman Blanca, the salad green, he actually was in power six, uh, six times. One, two, three, four, five. So, uh, the, importantly, all of these, all of them were generals. All of them basically came to power taking the capital by storm. But they took the capital by, by storm, dismissed the previous dictator, and uh, ruled for a couple of years, were dismissed by the next general went to exile to Mexico or Paris, then came back in a couple of years, and this continued. So the point is, and this is not like a small episode, this is 80 years in which um, more than a dozen of people came to power more than once. So this is really, I think, a good illustration that you could have an equilibrium which is uh, in which winners always spare losers. So Question. again, yeah. Uh, so sure. what would it take in the model to rephrase it so that you can allow democracy as one of the features, right? So you could you could argue that instead of you know marching on capital, you win elections. Is that yeah? Okay. And the thing is that this uh, we have always felt, Georgi and I, that this is totally about authoritarian regimes because I, I would think that in a democracy, at least in a mature democracy, the leader doesn't actually um, consider uh, consider a question what to do with the defeated opponent. It's really oh. it's it's, re it's really a kind of a sign of some when something goes wrong with a democracy, right? Or democracy unstable, when the leader has to decide whether to execute or not the previous leader. I know that, uh, that nowadays, uh, nowadays in the United States, there is a strange situation in which the defeated incumbent is, is basically the front runner for the next election to have a very good chance to win the next elections. And actually there are already talks that after winning, Donald Trump would go to Biden and his family. But I would say still in 250 years of American political history, this is about the second time and was 100 years ago when the incumbent, when the defeated incumbent played any kind of major role personally. So I would say that it's, it's a very authoritarian feature that the new leader decides what to do with the loser. So I, I, I have like conceptual difficulties mapping this into a democratic into a democratic story. We can talk about this later after the talk. <laughs> okay.
Okay, so basically this was an illustration to that this peaceful path that leaders alter in power in a authoritarian regime and come back and kill basically dying naturally, uh, that I use this Venezuela example to say that this is not a theoretical, just a theoretical possibility. Of course, this is a kind of a theoretical possibility, but still it's something that has happened, has happened historically and in a different paper, which was solely devoted to this kind of path, we brought some more historical, historical examples of, of these cases. In fact, in Latin America, it was not unique when people come back and forth, take power and still not execute each other. But, but uh, our main focus on this in this paper is the persistent degenerate autocracy part. Basically, every new winner represses the opposition. And on these parts, every new winner appoints uh, lieutenants of lower and lower competence, which it turns leads to bad decisions. Because that's like the logic of the model. Repressions make stakes higher, which in turn makes loyalty more important. Loyalty comes at the expense of competence because a less informed lieutenant is less likely is less likely to uh, to betray. So uh, this shows naturally in the kind of an irrational choice setting that repressions and low and low quality of the decisions. It actually uh, these two things these two things come come together. I'm I'm pretty sure that. Uh, when we look back at the history, at the history of Russia, back in 10 years, when we look back at history, we will know that what Putin does, it's not only a mistake, it was not only a mistake to launch a war, but basically for a year and a half, since, I don't know, spring 2022, every day that the war continues is a bad decision for him, eventually. It's a bad decision for Russia is for citizens, it's of course bad for Ukraine, but it's also bad, bad for him. But, not surprisingly, uh, more and more people repressed. Repressions became much harsher. At the elite level, people kept at a short leash, and not at the non-elite level, hundreds of people get to jail, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands actually fled fled the country, so it's a much harsher regime, and also it makes, uh, it continues to make bad decisions. So, um, in the paper, we also discussed the robustness of our model. One thing, one shortcut that we make in this model is that we just assume that reputation is a binary variable. But uh, one could do our model at the expense of more notation and we very little additional benefit, very little additional intuition, basically have uh, the, the, the reputation as in the Krebs and Wilson and the Grumman Roberts models of reputation. So basically you have a leader who uh, might with some probability be just intrinsically cruel. With every execution, you increase a perception that you are intrinsically cruel. So at some threshold, anyone who takes power from you has to execute you because uh, your um, the chance that you are actually intrinsically cruel, so you would basically execute everyone if you come back, is uh, sufficient that you are getting executed. So basically, the model will be the same, but of course, there will be much more cumbersome notation. Then um, we also did an exercise doing a council instead of a single lieutenant. So, for example, when a betrayal decision has to be made by several several lieutenants simultaneously, but and the leader chooses their competence as well, then basically the same things happen. The higher is the competence, the more likely they coordinate on a betrayal. So that it, the competence loyalty trade-off works with councils um, as well as with single single person. 
So again, the other shortcut with the reputation, we had the reputation zero and one, but we could also do the gradual building of reputation. Again, will not add much to intuition, but it's technically, technically possible. Okay, I, I think I talked enough. This is the first day, the first day of the invasion. This is um, basically a month, a month later. So most of the tanks that you see here, they were destroyed, uh, destroyed near, uh, near Kiev. Most of the assault divisions uh, were, uh, were lost. I also added, because it's general autocracy, these are, there is just some evidence, evidence um of corruption there is systematic evidence of corruption here you see the people that i was talking about this um loyal uh loyal uh incompetence you see these happy faces this is the moment when putin announces that russia integrates annexes the four um regions of ukraine you see the um the happy faces of these people. This illustrates the fading popularity of Putin because this is a part of the story. You become vulnerable, you repress, you survive a period, and then you have to appoint uh, a less competent advisors. This makes a disastrous decision more likely. So this is a kind of a picture of unity. A lot of people came to meet Putin to support the war, but these people, nobody came on their own. These are buses uh, that brought these people. This was totally, uh, totally an organized, uh, organized event. Okay, my last slide. Uh, the theory of the degenerate autocracy is about individual decisions that are singularly unfortunate. Individual decisions, of course, rarely play a critical role is institutions that matter, but there are authoritarian regimes, and we think that there is a whole pack of authoritarian regimes in which the leaders eventually make these disastrous decisions. The leaders that make these decisions, they possess a lot of personal power, but these regimes are not sultanistic, they are highly institutionalized. And our model of the general autocracy accounts for the uh, in a sense, inescapability of these bad decisions. When you become less popular, when you become reliant on repression, you're bound to um, restrict the information flows uh, that inform your decisions, and then uh, a bad decisions, a bad decision, uh, earlier or later is. Um, All right, thank you very much. Um, great, great talk, uh, Konstantin. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a comfortable more than 10 minutes for, for questions uh, from the audience. Actually, we have two questions in the in the chat. Uh, maybe I can ask Petar and Emre to unmute themselves and uh, yourself and, and ask the question directly. Would that be possible, Petar? Yeah, of course. Uh, thanks, Max. Um, so in your model, you have a you have a V and N parameters that are exogenous to the decision of the lieutenant, that seems. Uh, but does the dictator invest in affecting these uh, effectively these signals? Oh does no! The dictator have the have the power to affect V and N because it no, seems these are... that they yeah go ahead. Okay, okay, the, the and are basically a notation to the events that the dictator is vulnerable or not. And this is a random event where the dictator is vulnerable or not vulnerable. Right? So this is like, I don't know, what happens in the foreign markets, what happens with the price of oil, what happens with other other things. Sometimes leaders are vulnerable, sometimes leaders are less vulnerable. I mean, a typical 20th century dictator is 
vulnerable when the oil prices go down is less vulnerable when they hide. Right, but are you saying that these VNN are irrelevant to the decision of the lieutenant? Uh, the no, they are relevant okay. for the lieutenant. I thought that your question is whether the dictator could affect the probabilities with which he becomes vulnerable or not. No, he cannot. Okay, okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Amra, can... Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, so, uh, the question I wrote in the chat is about uh, PI, the punishment, the potential punishment for the lieutenant. I was wondering if PI uh, you consider as part of repression, because I was wondering what if PI is extremely high? If you fear your life, then will they ever betray? And second question okay, is... That, that's if, uh, let me answer this question. So, of course, in the model, if pi is very high, then there will be never, uh, never a betrayal, and you could appoint a very competent person. In reality, though, this is a complicated thing because there, there have been very few dictators that were never betrayed. So, even uh, those people who uh, who um, execute people who betray them, and sometimes the execution. Are, are horrible, like, I mean, it provides you with the worst possible possible utility, and still these people were betrayed. Because one problem for any dictator, um, as compared to a person in a normal contract theory model, is that you cannot, a dictator cannot punish additional on his loss of power, right? So every punishment, in a sense, is conditional on the dictator's survival. So, in a sense, you could have very high pi, but if, the, if there is a chance that your gamble succeeds, then even if pi is very high, so the, the torture and execution, still people do. do. Yeah, okay. Uh, if I can ask a second question is about, uh, so the disastrous decision in the model is about basically, uh, like it, disastrous defensive decision, like not defending yourself properly, rather than like attacking a, another country. I was wondering why, why would you attack a country in the context of this, like in the context of this model? No, like why, uh, why I think this is relevant to the story why Putin, uh, Putin invaded Ukraine. So the thing is that it, it, like whatever are the um many uh, many things that are happening as in every historical episode this was a zero or one decision you either invade or you not invade what i'm saying that uh even without knowing what we know now this decision was uh, was totally disastrous and in principle in principle all the information to know that this decision is um, going to be disastrous. Oh, Putin himself. Um, it's it was there. So a Russian like the problem. The problem is that if you need any explanation of why Putin invaded Ukraine, uh, it would at some point. Um, Assume that he was not rational, right? So he was is either ideological or short-sighted or something, uh, something else, right? But we are economic theorists, so we are trying to have everyone rational in our model. Everyone rational. The only thing that dictator wants is to stay in power to get his rewards for staying in power, and still, because. When he is vulnerable, he has to repress. When he represses, he has to rely on less competent people. So there is a high chance of a disastrous decision to make these disastrous decisions. I I hope you I answered your question. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much. Thank thank you. Um okay. Um are there any other questions from the audience? Just unmute yourself and, and go ahead. Francesco. Um Constantine, what would happen if you just use the standard perfect Markov instead of that refinement that you you impose. What would change? Uh, 
be first uh, it's it's not a very standard model so even standard markov is not um uh, it's not clear what a standard markov is because you probably would need some symmetry between agents because uh, there are potentially infinitely many players and then new players in yeah at least, at least formally these are new states when they make these decisions so okay there will be i mean it's an important ingredient of this model is is reputation right because the cost of repression comes from the reputation and it's difficult to have a reputation model and Perfect equilibrium there. Mm. I mean, it's it's sort of, it's sort of not interesting because, of course, like the reputation, you could uh, you could say that um, uh, that each new probability that uh, the incumbent is the commitment type is a new state, but then uh, the whole mark of perfect refinement doesn't have much bite, right? Well, you could have that the you know the previous you know you just have the previous period and you just check whether you were repressed or something like that. Um, so that's part of a state whether you were repressed by this individual or not, and that's it, right? Okay, then you could say that this is Markov. I mean, yeah. mm, the unknown. Because in your model, in your model, it matters that you repress somebody in the past, right? What I see, what I have in mind is you repress me. Uh, now, does we, that make uh, sense? I mean, we look at equilibria in which strategies, in which strategies uh, depend on uh, on binary reputation. So they we don't allow them to depend on the whole history, but they depend on this binary. Yeah, reputation. I understand, but but if you repressed Max at some point. But didn't repress me. You're a repressor in this in your model. Uh, whereas what I'm suggesting is, it could be that you're just repressing me. That that's all that matters, right? Uh, that's that's what I was thinking. Uh, yeah, that's that's probably true. The thing is mm -hmm. that we we wanted to have this dynamic to be as simple as possible we just wanted to have like the minimum the no, minimalistic, it's right. it's right. minimalistic right. model which, which would produce this sort of um sort of like loop dynamically but, but it's right that like we probably could extend it to what you described when reputation counts for more uh, than just whether you Ever repressed or not repressed. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I suggest we finish the official part of the presentation. So thank you, Constantine, again for for accepting our invitation and and uh, bringing such a big audience uh, today. And uh, see you in two weeks. But we are going to.